Thank you, Dr. Desmond, for joining us. Thank uh, you. We, we would like to briefly talk about uh, different diseases of hepatobiliary system, uh, the cancer of liver, uh, and also the liver transplant. What are the common uh, hepatological syndrome that you uh, treat in Singapore, and mm. you get a, a significant number of patients from Bangladesh? Yeah. So, what the best I, think, I think that the most the most common problem I see from Bangladesh now is what we call fatty liver, yeah. or in medical term, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or nephro. Yeah. Uh, I think there are some local studies showing that up to 40-50% of the Bangladeshi population have fatty liver disease. Yeah. So the, with better hygiene, we are seeing less and less hepatitis C and hepatitis B. As you know, any newborn in any part of the world nowadays, the moment they are born, they will, be, they will receive a hepatitis B vaccination. And all the blood bank in the world now will routinely screen for hepatitis C. So as a result, um, we are getting less and less hepatitis B and hepatitis C. And uh, Bangladesh being a Muslim country, there are very few alcoholic problems. So it's quite blessed in a way. So my experience is that uh, a Bangladeshi patient have, have, uh, have this uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease we will talk about shortly later. Another problem I often see sporadically from Bangladesh is uh, what we call hepatitis E, E for elephant. Mm. Hepatitis E is transmitted from what we call fecal oral transmission. Uh, so when if the feces from patients somehow contaminated drinking water or the food chain, they can transmit the diseases. And I still see quite a fair number of hepatitis E from Bangladesh. The good news is that hepatitis E patients, they can be very, very sick, but they almost always make it. Unless if a pregnant woman contracted the disease, they have a high risk to die from the problem. Otherwise, they are, they are fine. Yeah. So hepatitis E, hepatitis A, and also fatal liver disease, I think these are the common diseases that I see from patients from Bangladesh. Uh, about the uh, fatty liver, when we see uh, hepatologists here in Bangladesh, mm -hmm. uh, since it is very common, they say, okay, it's very common uh, mm -hmm. to have fatty liver, but uh, how serious it is? Should we be concerned about yeah. the fatty liver? Uh, so actually, hepatologists worldwide, so called experts, all agree that fatty liver disease is going to be the, the liver problem in the next century, in the coming years, coming decades, okay? Because we see less alcohol, less hepatitis B and C. So fatty liver patients have one of the five following. They are overweight, they have high cholesterol, high triglyceride, high sugar, and hypertension. In China, they call it the three highs, San Gao. Oh, okay. <laughs> high cholesterol, high sugar, and high uh, hypertension. So uh, this is, all these things are quite common in Bangladesh. Yeah. Uh, but they, there are a few things that the, the message that the public should know. The first is that fatty liver disease is a slowly progressive disease. And I mentioned the five risk factor. Mm -hmm. They may start off with just one, maybe they're just overweight and they have fatty liver. But if they don't control the diet and the body shape and the body size, sorry, uh, they can actually progress to have all the five uh, risk factors. So there are people that see me, for example, today for fatty liver, they're overweight, they are well otherwise. If they don't control the body weight and they keep eating uncontrollably, they will develop what we call full royal flush to everything, like right? high cholesterol, triglyceride, sugar, and hypertension. So these are all linked to the metabolic. Uh, yeah, we call it metabolic syndrome. They have all the five, and they can progress from fat to inflammation to fibrosis to cirrhosis and then cancer. So if you don't do anything about it, they will progress. Yeah. Another interesting feature about fatty liver disease is that uh, there are studies in America and in Europe. They follow fatty liver patients for more than 10, 20 years. They find that the top two causes of death from fatty liver patients are not liver related. In other words, when they are fatty liver, eventually you see them for 20 years. They don't. The liver problem is only the third commonest problem of, of, for death. They die from cancer and heart attack. But why? Uh, well, heart attack we can understand. If they have fatty liver disease, they have the metabolic syndrome, they are overweight, they have high cholesterol, hypertension, diabetes, they are going to affect the heart, they're going to have more heart problems. So when they have fatty liver uh, disease, is the body is telling you and the patient that uh, actually uh, the, they have a metabolic syndrome. The heart may have a problem. Okay? Yeah. So they have heart problem being the number one or number two cause of death. The second problem is cancer. We now know that being overweight is actually a risk factor for certain cancers, such as uh, stomach cancer, colon cancer, pancreatic cancer, breast and womb cancer. So, fatal disease it causes liver problem, but there's also a red flag that say that, well, this patient may have 
more cancer and this patient may have more risk of a heart problem. So this could be a very early sign. Uh, to be exactly, concerned. it's probably early, yeah, very good point, maybe an early sign, yeah, that's right. And uh, I have the privilege of having many beneficiary patients and friends. So I dine with them, I notice a few things about the way that Bangladeshi people eat. Uh, it is a very carbohydrate based kind of rice based kind of diet and they eat quite a fair amount. And uh, I remember having dinner at my friend's house and I would share with you that I'm eating with you for example. When, when I finish all my rice, before I know it, they are rice again. Because the, the host wife actually go behind me and pour extra rice on top. And I was just told that it is rude not to finish the rice because you are telling people that your food is not good. So um, I think Bangladesh is rice based, they eat a lot and uh, it, is, it is not a good thing to leave uncooked food, in, on, on, uh, to, to, to leave unfinished food on the table. So they finish all the rice. I think something that maybe the Bangladesh culture need to think about changing. We should limit the amount of carbohydrate. Rice is good but too good too much of a good thing is no good. <laughs> yeah. The second thing I notice about Bangladeshi living is that uh, I asked my Bangladeshi patient, what time do you take your dinner? They told me they take at 10 p.m. Apparently 10 o'clock is a common time that people wish home at the dinner. Uh, I think you guys are one of the most hardworking people on earth. Definitely more hardworking than, than Singaporeans. So they told me that they eat at 10 o'clock and they're hungry. So that, then what happened at 7 o'clock, okay? At 7 o'clock, they are hungry, they eat snack at the working place. Mm -hmm. And then at home, they eat another meal. In other words, they are eating, I think they eat too much, I think. For me, I take my dinner at 6.30 or 7 o'clock, I sleep at 10 p.m. Uh, but Bangladeshi people will be eating a snack at 7 p.m. and at 10 p.m., the full dinner. I think they may be eating too frequently. Perhaps they can cut down one of the two. So, uh, cancer is uh, on the rise, uh, but there are many types of cancer for the liver and uh, biliary system. So, mm -hmm. which cancer are more common and uh, what is the advancement in the diagnosis and yeah. treatment? Model? Yeah, so the, for liver cancer, there are two types. Either the cancer that comes from the bowel duct, we call it cholangio carcinoma, or they come from liver cells, we call it hepatocellular carcinoma. Between the two, hepatocellular carcinoma is more common. If I'm not wrong, liver cancer was the, one of the top 10 cancer in Bangladesh as well, okay? I think in the past they have hepatitis B, and now we have a fatty liver, so I think there is cancer. So there's something new about uh, liver cancer. Uh, the first, the most important thing is that there are better treatment for liver cancer. In the past, the treatment is surgery or chemo, and chemo doesn't really work. And the other intermediate treatment, they can buy time, but they do not cure the cancer in all patients. So a lot of patients with advanced disease uh, and they have a uh, chemo that doesn't work very well and that's no good. Approximately about 5 to 10 years ago with a new drug called sorafenib. Sorafenib buy more time. Patients with sorafenib live longer, the disease are being controlled longer, the cancer don't grow so fast. It buy them a few months. After that, there's a second generation sorafenib that make them live a bit more even when the first uh, generation of sorafenib doesn't work. But about two years ago, with a new treatment, it's called immunotherapy. Immunotherapy works like that. Uh, the liver cancer, as in any kind of cancer, are very smart. They can actually blur our immune system. They can escape from the immune system attacking the cancer. You know, our immune system will go out and try to wipe out all the cancer cells. But cancer will camouflage themselves so that our immune system does not recognize the cancer. Immunotherapy will stop this blockage, wake up our immune system, to kill the cancer cells and there have been very very good results so nowadays we have uh, uh, what we call oral chemotherapy like sorafenib we have a second generation sorafenib we have uh, also immunotherapy and I think uh, experts, researchers, scientists are trying to figure out we have so many options maybe combination is better than any one so how to combine two oral drugs or one oral drug with immunotherapy or two immunotherapy uh, therapy I think we are still figuring out, but good news is we have more weapons to, to use to treat liver cancer patients. Uh, you are running the uh, liver, donor liver transplant for a pretty long time mm -hmm. and there has been uh, development in the uh, treatment and uh, outcome of the mm -hmm. patient survival. Uh, so uh, how do you define the uh, living donor liver transplant in Singapore mm -hmm. in comparison to other countries like India or other parts? 
I think uh, most places uh, there's a learning curve. So the first part is very steep in the sense that if you, any country, any center first start a doing liver transplant, your first five to ten cases, you have to tell the patients that, well, we are still trying to figure out the result will not be international standard. But Singapore, India, as in most other Asian countries, those that are engaged, they have, they have engaged in life donor liver transplant, uh, we have enough experience. I would say, in general, less than 10% will die from the operation. But, but survival is not 90% for all. For example, for, 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 for liver cancer in particular, uh, actually, uh, some cancer can uh, spread out of the liver, too small to be detected before the transplant, and they come back after the transplant. So liver transplant care, if you see the patient very well, so, uh, the, we can get up to 80-90% long-term survival. But if we transplant cancer that are aggressive or cancer that, uh, that have already spread or are very huge, with a high chance of spreading, then after transplant, they can have up to 50% of the chance to come back. After liver transplant, if the cancer come back, uh, is it bad news? Yeah. So I think for liver transplant, for liver cancer, uh, the, the whole idea is to scissor the patient properly. Then we can avoid the recurrence after the transplant. It is devastating to have a liver cancer recurrence after a liver transplant. Because to go a liver, to undergo a liver transplant, patients spend a lot of money for the pre-transplant workup and for the transplant and for the post-transplant care. They put their friend or the relative, which is a donor's life at risk. The risk for the donor is very low, 0.5%. Some are low figure, but 0.5 is more than zero. Mm. So that they put their family member at risk, they spend a huge amount of money, and if they fail, uh, cancer come back six months, a year later. It is devastating from, from my experience. Okay. So what is the average survival rate after the transplant? The average transplant rate will be about 90% long-term survival because the risk, because we are pretty good. How many years? Uh, once they survive within the first one year, they normally survive continuously. Okay. Then they have problem later on. We can talk about the problem later on, problem uh, later. Okay. Immediately after transplant, they can die from the surgery, they have blood loss. Uh, in fact, I have one patient recently that after liver transplant, he was very well. He is a foot he is a basketball coach, you know. I don't better that she don't play basketball, but basketball is a pretty exhaustive game. He's a coach, he had a normal cardiac workup before the transplant. But the second day after the transplant, he had a heart attack. Luckily we caught him. Uh, on time, he, we rushed into the NGO room, we put in, we did the NGO for the heart, put in a stand, he survived. Today, he came to my clinic, walked in very well. He's challenging me when to play basketball with him. Yeah, he's taller than me, by the way. Yeah. Okay, so they can die from heart attack, they can die from an operation, they can have a complication. I would say roughly 5 to 10 percent. But if they survive after one month, they can discharge from the hospital. They normally live very long because for the other problem we can control. So for hepatitis C and hepatitis B, we have very good oral treatment that can control them. For liver cancer, problem is patient selection. If we don't select properly, we select those uh, aggressive cancer, pre-transplant, some of the cancer can come back from them, but that drop the survival, obviously. And there are other problems, like alcoholic liver problem is a big challenge because if the alcohol damage the liver, after the liver transplant, some patients go back to drinking and that kill the liver. Yeah. Other than that, I would say that we can control most of the problem quite well. It's only cancer, alcohol that come back that we have to, to control. So I would say 80-90% of the patient after transplant can be expected to live for long term if they can survive through the initial period. Uh, so the rejection of uh, host tissues, those are no longer a problem? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, you know, when uh, I my tissue belongs to me, I don't reject my tissue. But if someone gives an organ into my body, my immune system recognizes it as something foreign and they will attack it. So uh, rejection occurs in all forms of transplant. But for liver transplant, for some strange reason, liver is a very tolerant organ. We put a new liver in, rejection is not common. And even if rejection occur, uh, Actually, we can just increase the dose of immunosuppression and we can control that. We hardly have a patient with, that, that had a rejection so bad that they die. Usually, we can, we can actually control the rejection pretty well. Not a problem. Unlike kidney transplant, that every single rejection, you lose some kidney tissues and that's not good for the long-term outcome. Liver transplant, rejection, not common, can be well controlled, not a big issue. Okay. So in a hepatocellular carcinoma, you have the liver transplant, but for the cholangiocarcinoma, I think it's a bit difficult in yeah. comparison to the uh, yeah. liver cancer. Yeah, so for, for cholangiocarcinoma or bowel cancer, uh, usually when they are discovered, they are late. 
in the old days, if they can survive a surgery, that's great. But many cancer come back after surgery, even if they have a good operation. But, uh, but we are now actually have many studies that show that even if they have bowel duct cancer, they can still do a transplant. In fact, we did a transplant two years ago uh, in Singapore. Uh, that is a Singaporean. He had bowel duct cancer. So we have a protocol to follow. We give radiation, we give chemotherapy. We control the cancer before. We do a PET scan to make sure that cancer doesn't spread. We do an exploration operation. We open up the belly. We look for any lymph node. If they confirm no spread, we then plan for an operation a week later. So that gentleman had a successful liver transplant for cholangiocarcinoma carcinoma or bowel cancer. Two years later, he's still doing very well. I think patient selection is important. Um, if you select a patient properly, you don't select those that are aggressive cancer. Transplant can be a very, very satisfying treatment. Thank you, Dr. Prisma. Thank you very much.